Okay, we are recording. Ruth, how are you today? I'm good, thank you. How are you? I'm all right. I'm all right. Sun's shining and, uh, and it's about to start a, a nice bank holiday. We're recording this on the 5th. And uh, yeah, we've got a long, a long weekend because something's happening. I'm not that fussed, but something's happening. But, yeah, I live in central London, so I'm probably going to get oh, the... Oh, mate, really? Yeah, get the brunt of it, I think. Oh. And it was the same when uh, the Queen died. It was yeah. all very, um, what's the word? <laughs> very committed people. Yeah, it's weird, isn't it? Like I don't, I don't want to kind of get into it too much because some people really like all that. Yeah. But uh, I remember like the Queen come to where I lived when I was about seven, and, uh, and we all got frog marched down to the side of the road and given these flags, and we just to stand there just waving flags at this car that went past. I remember just thinking like. Why am I doing this? <laughs> I, and I was, you know, I'm not suggesting I was particularly ahead of me time, but I was thinking, time is like it's bloody freezing. Like, why, <laughs> why, why am I at school? Why am I standing here waving a flag at a car? And I still don't get it now, forty however many years later. So, it's good that the uh, the Queen came. The most famous person who came to Wensbury, where I'm from, was Eric Bristow. Came to the mate. Best. I'd much rather have had that. The crafty Cockney turning up in your own town. I feel all over that. At the local Betfred, yeah, signing autographs, and letting people have a chuck with you and everything. Now, I wasn't into darts then, so I didn't go down. It was literally like down the road from my parents' house. Yeah. Um, but I'm, I'm well into darts now, so I wish yeah. I'd gone because he's passed away, sadly, hasn't he? Yeah. You still got you still got a few of the golden ones left, didn't you? Is Bobby George still floating about. I've met Bobby George, yeah. Bobby George is still going. I met Did him you get to school. shake the hand full of, full of full of full sovereigns? It must have been a hefty old clinch that it was and he's a real raconteur i think does that mean what does raconteur mean look tells good stories I think. yeah definitely he's a real raconteur and he did a little uh went to the circus tavern in essex do you know that place that's a, that's about five minutes from where i'm sitting there are you joking no way no. well they could have told me it was a strip club as well as well oh, as yeah. a venue roof right <laughs> check this out right this so when i was about 23 24 they there was two floors there right and so i think the darts was downstairs and the strip the strip club was upstairs but prior to that because throughout the sort of 80s it was like proper old school entertainment shawaddy waddy playing then you get the arrows it was like you'd get everything it was it was it was proper like jim jim davidson would be there like regular it was that kind of level of um of entertainment in the 80s However, they turned it into a nightclub in uh, in the early 90s. Now, check this out, right? You used to pay, I think, about a tenner to get in, which was quite a lot of money then. But guys and girls would get split up. The guys would go upstairs and the girls would go downstairs. They'd put on strippers for the guys upstairs and then they'd put on strippers for the girls downstairs. You'd have your kind of, like, split entertainment from, like, 10 till 11. Then at 11... They'd push you all together and bring out a buffet before the music. <laughs> <laughs> What's well, not to like? It's, it's a tombola at the end, like a raffle. <laughs> that is amazing. So they send all the men up to, like, I assume, get an erection from the women, and all the Leave women that was the plan. become <laughs> excited. Yeah. So I'll shag over the buffet at the end. Yeah, but the thing is, it's, it's really weird. I went to um. Uh, a singles night when I, I worked on a building site like years ago and I went to a singles night with a load of like my, the fellas that I worked with that were older and divorced. And, uh, and I was kind of probably about 20 years younger than everyone else that was there. And I was just sort of fascinated because I'd never been to anything like this. It was in Brentwood, home of Towie, but it was kind of pre, pre all of that. And uh, I think I was the only guy in there that had hair. It was, it was a really, <laughs> a really strange <laughs> setup. But someone said, oh, there's a swimming pool out there. And I was like, oh, can you have a swim? And they went, no, but there's a barbecue and it's free burgers. I'm quite greedy, I'm not going to lie, Ruth. But it was like, if I can go for a night out and there's lager and there's also free burgers all night, I'm happy there. It's... I don't necessarily need to mingle. No, not at all. Well, when I left the Circus Tavern, I noticed that they were doing a night that was £20 all you can drink. So, you, mm. you know, that doesn't surprise me. Again, not averse to that myself. Mm. Probably want to go back and get involved. I mean, there's a cost of living <laughs> crisis going on. Is that what you can get? 
Why, I'm, I'm a club promoter. Why am I not moving on the cost of living crisis by doing them kind of deals again? It makes sense. <laughs> so is your um, club near Perfleet then? You know, Pink Toothbrush, is it? Is that? Yeah, but that's about, it's about mm, 25 minutes sort of further out of London, um, the, the Toothbrush. Okay. Um, that's not like the Circus Tavern. We need to clarify that. Well, maybe you should think about making it a bit more like the Circus Tavern. Oh, yeah, something a little bit blue for the mums and dads' early doors. Yeah, why not? <laughs> right, Ruth, thanks ever so much for coming on today. Um, I could I could talk about working men's clubs and, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and yeah, that kind of mid, mid-80s entertainment all day long. But we, we, we may well touch on that when we get to your last track. But to start yeah. with, I want you to tell me the song, please, that you regard as having the greatest ever intro, please. So it's been this one for a long time for me. It's Theme from Sparta FC by The Fall. That, to me, is the greatest ever intro. There were other ones I could have picked that I'll give notable mentions later because this was really hard. But when it comes to the greatest intro, this is bar none the best. Um, I'm a big Fall fan, but I wouldn't say that. I mean, uh, they've got such an extensive back catalogue. It's very daunting. I saw somebody else describe it as daunting to think there's probably yeah. like 76 albums and to go back as well. I didn't get into them until quite late. Like Sparta FC, that track is from 2004, I think. Um, so it's quite late on mm. fall. Um, and I got into them by watching, do you remember that show? Adam and Joe on Channel 4. They yeah, did of course. People... Okay, great. So they, I was about 13. Um, I used to watch a lot of telly and that'll probably come through with some of these tracks that I'll talk about. But Adam and Joe did a thing called Vinyl Justice where they would have a person on and they'd go through the record yeah. collection and they had Marky e. Smith on. And I was like sort of aware of the fall and aware of Marky e. Smith because at the time I was really into the band XTC mm. who were that sort of post-punk, you know, 70s stuff. So I used to go to record fairs to buy like all the XTC records and you'd see like people trying to get full big, you know, rare full collections. You used yeah. to buy record collector magazine, which is a bit of an odd thing for a 13-year-old girl to buy. Yeah. I would see, you know, loads of stuff about the fall. So they always intrigued me, but I found... Marky e. Smith a bit frightening. Yeah. <laughs> and then when I saw him on Vinyl Justice, he's pissed. He's got a fag on. He like tries to beat up Adam and Joe. He puts a plastic bag over Joe's head. And I really liked him. I yeah. thought I like I like the cut of this guy's jib. So yeah. as well, like they played like a snippet of Ghost, it, the cover of Ghost in my house. Yeah. And that do 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 it just feels, it just felt like it was like, oh, like I love this straight away. This yeah. just something about that sound. Um, and actually Frank Skinner got into the fall quite late as well. And he said the first time he heard the fall, it was like he'd been hearing the music playing in his head for the first time ever. And that's how I feel about him. Um, so the, the intro is uh it's like a guitar bit like and then it's and then uh Marky e. Smith says, Hey. And I just like, yeah. I like songs. It's urgent, like, isn't it? It's really urgent. Yeah, and I like that. And there's like drums, it's do 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 do. And I like any song where someone just shouts hey, or yeah. you know, I like anything where there's like loads of banging drums and it's fast and it, I like urgency in songs. There are very few slow songs that I like. And yeah, with this one, it just gets straight into it. Yeah. I tell you what, there's there's two things. I mean, what you just said there, thundering drums and then someone shouting, "Hey!" I presume. Uh, uh, do you know New Rose by the Damned? Yes. I mean, that's a perfect example of that. Yes, <laughs> that because it's like, is she is it is she really going out? Yeah. With and then it's like, <laughs> just like yeah. <laughs> yeah, anything like that. Like another to give a notable mention to another song. I know we're talking about my favorite one, but you know. Um, like Death from Above, um, Romantic Rights, where it's yeah. dun, 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 yeah. and then yeah, you just uh, uh, yeah. Uh, love that. <laughs> that full track, I don't know what come first, but can you hear the similarities between that and Helicopter by Block Party? Oh, do you know what? Yeah, I can. Yeah, I can. And uh, I think that that came first, definitely. Helicopter yeah. by Block Party was. Do you know what? Actually, I don't know what came first. Thinking yeah, about it, yeah, I, I was. I, I think maybe Block Party was maybe two thousand and six, seven. Maybe I don't know. Like uh, second single, like 
but uh, it's just yeah. got that. Like, it's very similar guitar line. And, uh, I'd never thought about that. That's so true. Like mm. I'm just I'm trying to think. I used to work in Music Zone. If you remember that shop, yeah. And block helicopter had just come out, so I'm trying to pair up the years. And it could be the same year because yeah. I used to work at Greg's. I left Greg's in 2004 and then I went to Music Zone. And I remember that Silent Alarm. Is that the yeah. album? That was mm -hmm. uh, massive at the time. Mm. Um, but yeah, there is a similarity. That's mm. a great intro to Helicopter as well. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Right. Solid choices. I'm going to ask you for your track two now, please, Ruth. And I'm going to ask you, please, to tell me the first song you remember hearing that had an emotional impact on you, please. So it is Sledgehammer by Peter Gabriel. The emotional impact was one of fear. Has anyone ever said that they were scared? Because that came out, um, probably I was about three, maybe. 86, 87, I think that came out. Yeah, I was about three. And um, it was really, like, I, I remember hearing... No, I, no, I saw the video first, sorry, because it had that really iconic video. Mm. And it was all like sort of, uh, it was Ardman animation and uh, plasticine and all that stuff. And um, I was scared by it because Peter, it's this like face front on and then all things are happening to his face. And I'm not a fan of like uh, anything like that, like body horror, they call it in, in films. I don't, I don't mm. like stuff like that. And there's a bit where the plasticine him is hitting himself with hammers. Mm. And I was like, oh God, this is scary. I don't like it. So my mum used to have the radio on all the time when I was little. Local radio, BRMB, Beacon, which is a black country one. And um, they would play this and I'd go turn it off, just turn the radio off. If they played Sledgehammer, just turn it off. I was so scared. But then um, as I got older, I, I don't even know what it was. I must have heard it again as I was older and thought, yeah. oh, my God, I love this song's amazing. Yeah. Um, and Peter Gabriel's really nice. Like I was watching a Genesis documentary recently and I thought, what yeah. a nice man. Yeah. <laughs> Did you watch the uh, the Brian Pern thing that Simon yeah. Drake done? And the fact that he even went past like at the end and made a cameo in it was so fucking cool. It was like they've literally ripped the piss out of you for like yeah. however many episodes and you've just put your name to it as well. What what a dude. Yeah, I love him. Like and he's um I was I was looking into loads of stuff about him because I always found him like um and I'm more intrigued by things that scare me or disturb me. And there's yeah. a bent to everything I like where I like it but I'm like oh god this is a bit weird mm. um and I was looking into loads of stuff about him and I remember seeing the video for digging in the dirt which I think won an award and that's of an album called us where he's talking about like splitting up with his wife and yeah. therapy and stuff so I'd always found him a bit of a like a dark person but then mm. yeah he's he's not really like yeah. I mean well maybe, you know maybe he is but uh, I really love that Sledgehammer's got to be one of my favourite songs, but I do remember the 80s was a bit of a weird and scary time to be a child. Um, and I was exposed to a lot of telly and probably a lot of stuff I shouldn't have been watching that's probably yeah. disturbed me. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so uh, fear was the emotion, but I don't feel that anymore. I just feel I feel pure love for that song. It's great. It's, uh, it's one of them songs... Like I'm, I'm 50, so I, I kind of would have heard that when I was about 14. And I remember thinking, like, it was great. And I had no idea he was in Genesis. I didn't really know too much about Genesis then. And and then as the sort of 80s got to a close, it was like, and the 90s started, it was like Genesis for this kind of dad rock band that you just, it was Phil Collins and that stuff wasn't cool anymore. And, and it was only really a little after that, sort of going back and going, all oh, right, so he was in Genesis. And then checking out like because like what you said there, there was a video to um what's the song called uh in your wardrobe i can't think what it's called i know what it's like in your wardrobe or whatever and, and i remember seeing the video and it was like gabriel with these like massive like flowers on his head like just jumping around like an absolute loon in like this kind of lycra cat suit <laughs> and just thinking fucking hell that's mad and it, and it sounded really out there as well and just being sort of drawn to it and, and i think one of the things that uh, you know, obviously Harry Styles covered Sledgehammer, you know, a year or so ago and has turned it on to like, my kids listen to it now. And it's it's such a perfect pop record, a great intro as well. It's such yes. a sudden like start to a record. But I think one of the things that people constantly overlook is just how good Peter Gabriel's voice is. 
is absolutely phenomenal. Right. This is this is the thing. When I went back and listened to it, I was like, I didn't realise how amazing he sounded. Yeah. How great it was. That's one of my favourite things about the track is how good his voice sounds. Yeah. I really, really enjoy that every time I listen to it. Yeah, that's so right. Love it. Love but it. I didn't know it was in Genesis either until mm. I went back and started looking. That's the thing with most of my musical choices. It's like I find out something, you know, that was in the 70s or 80s, and then I go back, like um, Terry Hall is the yeah. example. I go back and find that stuff, um, which is great. You've got, like, a whole yeah. back catalogue to get into. There's a really <laughs> weird thing about... Um, like, because Terry all done so much stuff with so many different people, and it's and it's easy just to kind of look back at the at the specials and and and, and Fun Boy and Colourfield and stuff. He done something. I don't know if you have heard it. Around about eighty nine, he partnered up with Dave Stewart, the Eurythmics, and done yeah, this like, Vegas, uh, Vegas, yeah. And there's a track by them. I used to watch it. I used to record it on a VHS from like the chart show back back when he used to record the <laughs> bits of the chart show, and it was a track called Possessed, and it's. Fucking excellent. It's not on Spotify, but it's on YouTube. It's such a good tune. I am a huge Terry Hall fan. Mm. Um, and uh, I know every pretty much every side project yeah. he's involved in. And um, yeah, Vegas. I, that's actually one I'd forgotten about. But I used to like, oh, God, I've just, again, just collect things, collect everything he'd ever done. He'd been in like, he'd done like the colour field, didn't he? He'd done Fun Boy 3. He'd done a thing with Tricky. And That's right. And Alban, Nearly God, that was called, I think. Mm. Um, yeah, he's done stuff with Ian Brody and uh, Damon Alban. And yeah, as well as his own solo stuff. Yeah. Yeah, he's um, sadly no longer with us. Mm. Um, but yeah, he's, yeah, love him so much. And I didn't find him a sort of frightening figure like uh, Peter Gabriel. I found him quite a cuddly, a cuddly figure. <laughs> Terry Hall. That's quite strange that you say that because I, I would have probably been about the age when you got freaked out by Peter Gabriel when I saw the video to Ghost Town when I was a kid. Oh yeah. And and sonically as well, Ghost Town sounds so fucking creepy, doesn't it? And yeah. I was just like, wow, what what is this? And then seeing him, like seeing like Never One that all jumping around in the in the thing, but he's pretty static, isn't he? And he's yeah. just doing, he's just being Terry Hill. He's sort of scowling at the camera, just completely deadpan. And it's just he unnerved me, like when I see sort of early sort of. But I suppose it was just that video and that song. But that was like one of the first records. That's the first record I ever put on on a jukebox. I was in Yarmouth and I remember my dad gave me 5p and I put that on. And so I wanted to listen to Ghost Town by the specials. And yeah, he was, uh, he was just a legend, Terry Hall. Like he come, yeah. he come to the, he come to me club, he come and DJ the toothbrush and he was just a, an absolute diamond, just such a lovely guy. And, and I think he was, he just knew music. And I think there was a lot of kind of two-tone fans turning up just to ex you know, expect him to come on and just play the beat and the selector and stuff like that. He started with Bowie and he just went all over the place and it was like, that's what you want from a DJ. Like, somebody that's like, yes, he kind of cut his teeth with a two-tone thing, but like, he's done so much stuff and, and that kind of was really reflective in his, his DJ set as well. Yeah, oh, what an absolute niche. He's really, um like, uh, sorry, I'm going on too much about Terry Hall, but he's really dry, he's really dry and really witty. Like, one of the things I really like is, like, witty and funny lyrics and he just kept that through the whole yeah. his, uh, career. So, Absolutely. Yeah. So, Black Country, that's where you grew up, yeah? Yeah. And uh, and how was that? Nice place to grow up? Fond uh, memories? No, 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 not not really. Like, um, it was uh, Black Country is like very industry based. Like, loads of factories that all sort of got closed down. All my family, like my dad, is was like worked in a factory, and my mom actually just everyone worked in a factory, and there were loads of pubs. I think at one point I looked up where I was born, and there were one hundred and twenty five pubs in a very small place, oh. um, like within that area. But now there's probably like five. There was nothing, sort of nothing happening. I'd say it's a very deprived area. Um, and yeah, just not much to do. And uh, I think there was no sort of like, uh, it was all about sort of grafting. There was no sort of encouragement of being creative. Yeah. I mean, maybe it's different now, I don't know. But um, it was all about sort of going to work, coming home and, and that was it. Um, yeah, so just quite a, like, a, I'd say a bit of a gritty upbringing. Sure. So. How musical was it? Was 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 the music on at home? 
yeah so there was like we had some I remember we had some um vinyls we had like a Bob Marley greatest hits vinyl we had a Thompson twins vinyl and my mum had got loads of old vinyls from uh you know 60s and 70s and the radio was always on when I was getting ready for school and another song that I sort of felt an emotion for was Little China Girl by David Bowie because that would always be playing and little you know being a little child I was just like really intrigued by it uh we'd always have Top of the Pops on um and my dad as well my dad my mum and dad split up when I was little but when my dad lived with us he would sit in the back room and play a tape and it would have things on it like centerfold two four six eight two four uh what else it had like and then it had, he'd have like a randy crawford album yeah. oh and he had kate bush the whole story vinyl yeah. so all that sort of stuff would be going on but my parents weren't musical it was just sort of you know it was going on in the background yeah i'll tell you what you mentioned randy crawford i'll, I'll do a i'll do a once a month podcast with um a kind of, sort of stand-up we've not stand up he's a musician comedian called cunt in the gang and, oh, I um, know them. They're great. I see oh, them live. Yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. my best mate. So we we've been friends since we were we we were five. We met at Cubs when we were little boys, and oh, uh, and we do this retrospective podcast once a month where we go back forty years uh, to the month and we talk about Top of the Pops and what was on it and stuff like that. And Randy Crawford was on it, um, and and we'd had too much to drink by the time we finished recording the podcast, and we was listening to Randy Crawford. Um, it was just pathetic. There was just two 50-year-old men just getting a bit welling up, just yeah. listening to Randy Crawford, because her voice is unreal. It's absolutely unreal. We started off having a little sort of dance around the street life, and before you know it, we're just sitting there crying into our pints, listening to One Day I'll Fly Away, and it's like, oh, God, goosebumps talking about it. Oh. Yeah, One Day I'll Fly Away. Like, well, my dad would sit, like with a glass of whiskey in the back room uh, going, oh, I'm, I'm going to do that one day. I'm going to fly away. It's like, Dad, just stop. It's just a song. Um, I'm on that Monday night roof. <laughs> <laughs> but what, yeah, what a voice on Street Life on One Day I'll Fly Away. Like, oh, my God, yeah. She was a constant sort of yeah. growing up, yeah. Okay, let's talk school. Tell me the song that reminds you of your time at school, please, Ruth. So there was many I could choose again, but I went for No, No, No by Dawn Penn. Okay. So around that time, I would have been about nine, I think. And there was a real, do you remember this? There was a real, around sort of 1992, there was like a real reggae, it was called Ragga in Smash Hits. They said, there's a new thing in music, it's called yeah. Ragga. And in Smash Hits, it was like, how to do the Dutty Wine, how to do the Bogle, how to do the Butterfly, I'm nine, like, and I'm thinking, I've got to learn, I've got to learn to do these dances, okay, <laughs> so, um, all, and then around that time, there was all, there was Chakademus and Pliers, CJ Lewis, Bitter McLean, Shabba Ranks, Shaggy, uh, Shaggy just come through then as well, Shaggy, oh, Carolina, that was, mm. the, yeah, that was big, um, yeah, so, so many tracks like that, and the reason I've picked Shy Guy is big, uh, sh not Shy Guy, that's a, you cut that bit. <laughs> the reason I picked, that's another song. The reason I picked uh, Dawn Penn is because me and my uh, friend Shabnam, best friends at school, we used to go to a youth club called the Mouse Hole in Darleston and it'd been put on for, give the kids something to do after school. Sure. And you would go and there was like a tuck shop and uh, there was a pool table and there was an activity room that just had like an exercise bike in it. It was an empty room with an exercise bike and you could go after school from like six till eight. And it was always silent until one day we went in and we were like, oh, they've got music. There was music and there were, there was a, there was like a first track that came on was something called Get Away by Max, who were like a duo, like around that time. And then the next track was No, No, No by Dawn Penn. But they were the only two tracks they got. So they just went in a loop for like two hours every time we were there. So, you know, that no, 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 just kept mm. coming round. And it just really reminds me of that time. Yeah. Um, and that sort of, yeah, that's that sort of resurgence of, of those old sort of yeah. dance hall songs. Yeah. I love that song. Do uh, you? Yeah. I, uh, right. I, I've got this weird attachment to it, right? And uh, I... I Apart from the toothbrush, I, do another, I used to do another little night for 10 years in in, in, um, in East London. And 
And what I would do, I would never really sort of DJ much, but I'd always do the first hour. And the guy that I used to run the night with is a podcast called Screw This Pip, and he'd be like, "I know him, yeah, right." And so Pip would be like, "Okay, when it gets to when it gets to ten, I'll, I'll, I won't need to look at me watch. I know what's happening." And it was always I played Dawn Penn as my last record, and the minute cause it's got a great intro, it's like da 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 da, da and then it drops out, and uh, and he's like, "Yeah." So I'm, I'm constantly whenever Pip mentions me and music, he's like, "Yeah, Dawn Penn." Like, because that was my my signature tune at our club night for 10 years so it's an absolute cracker and i tell you what there's a performance of it lee thompson from madness um goes out as the lee thompson scar orchestra and uh and bizarrely you just mentioned him he'd done a, a fantastic track with bitty mclean and oh, uh yeah. about five years ago but when you see him live occasionally if she's over he'll perform that with Dawn Penn and she, ah, oh, her voice is still unreal, but so good. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's a tune. It's what, and it is probably like, I didn't really enjoy going to school. So that is one I look back with, with fondness. Yeah. Um, that tune, definitely. Oh, I'm glad you like it. I'm glad you give it a tune. Do you look back fondly on school? Not at all. No, I hated it. Like I used to um, wag it. We call it in the black country, wagging it, which is skiving, I suppose. Yeah. Um, as soon as I was sort of old enough to wag it, I started wagging it because yeah. I just, um, I was kind of like, um, I was listening to the Nick Helm one you did actually, and he talks about sort of being different at school. And I was just like, I was just different. Like I was, I looked different. Like I was bigger than the other girls. I was taller. I had like, I wasn't really, I was really interested in music and comedy and I wasn't interested in sports. I was really bad at sport. And There wouldn't have been many 13 year olds buying record collector. Exactly that. (laughs) So that's the thing I might touch on as we talk about, well, maybe I'll touch on it now, but I didn't have friends who were into the same music as me. So it felt like you were either into um, Peter Andre Hansen, you know, that sort of stuff, take that. And I tried to get into take that when I was in primary school, but I was like, I was doing it just because... Everybody liked take that. Sure. Even though, even though I do think Prey is what a tune, but anyway. <laughs> um, and then there was like, so there was that group of people, and then there were people who just listened to like hard, like like all like trance. There was like trance around what Radio One would play, and yeah. or they'd listen to like bootleg things. And then you'd be into either rock, like metal, like it was um, new metal, so it was corn, you know, Limp Bizkit. This one was a bit older. Yeah just absolute shite in my opinion although you can probably I can probably pick out a few tunes that I quite like yeah. and there was there was no one who like I wanted to go to gigs first gig I ever went to was Terrorvision when I was about 14 so I think they're a great band are they from Birmingham no they're from Leeds Leeds yeah and I went to see Space who were from Liverpool that was yeah. another one but I had to my mum would go well you can go but you have to take someone with you and I'd have to like convince my friends who weren't into that music at all and I think yeah. you were not enjoying this so there yeah. was just it was just a bit of a I just felt like I, I just didn't want to be there really and I found it I found it um I, I thought this is a long time eight till three eight till three thirty this is a long time for me to sit in one place doing something I don't like sure more often than not I would wag it and then I would go back home and I would listen to Radio 1 when Mark and Lard were on Mark yeah. Riley and uh, Mark Riley um and I would just absorb you know everything that they were playing and then again evening session with Steve Lamack and Joe Wilder yeah. just absorb all of that stuff tape things and that was what I was really interested in and I was musical at school like I played the guitar but I didn't do it through school I learned it and then I was in a band at school but it was a source of shame to be carrying a guitar around people just take the piss yeah. um and now the mate who played the piano and stuff and you, you were seen as a bit of a swatty person yeah. if you did that um Whereas actually it's the coolest thing in the world that you can do. Yeah, Talks on them. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I didn't enjoy school at all. Couldn't wait to leave, but I ended up staying in sixth form. And then I worked as a special needs school assistant at my school for a year before I went to university. And honestly, like, yeah, I, I never look back at it fondly yeah. at all. I'm so glad to be an adult. <laughs> what, what, what did you want to be? Oh, what did I want to be? Yeah. I wanted to be a, a like a musician, a rock star. Yeah. Like I wanted to be that. But always since I was little, when I was little, I was like used to watch loads of comedy and be like, I want to be a comedian. That's the only yeah. thing I want to do. 
And then uh, as I got older, I was like, mm, I'm probably a bit too shy for that. I'll probably be a guitarist in a band. Yeah. Um, but then obviously that sort of stuff, when you go to the careers advisor, they say, oh, have you thought about going into nursery work or, you know, like there's some jobs going at the Iceland and stuff like that. So I did a lot of like, I just never thought I would earn a living off anything like that. I'm not a good enough musician <laughs> to do something like that. Yeah. But in terms of writing comedy, that's actually what I'm doing now. But yeah. I've got a full-time job. It's just my sideline at the minute. What kind of comedy was you you're growing up watching? Absolutely everything. Like the first thing I started watching was Monty Python, like the reruns and stuff. Then as I got older, it was things like the Mary Whitehouse Experience, Jack D. I remember his show coming on Channel 4. Um, oh, honestly, if you name something, the young ones like Bottom. Um, you mentioned Adam and Joe. Yeah, Adam and Joe. Yeah, I'm just going right back to to when I was little. Honestly, everything to Richard Pryor stuff. I shouldn't have been watching Ben Elton, Richard yeah. Pryor, like Frank Skinner, Fancy Football League. I could. Whose line is it anyway? Yeah. Um, any any comedy from that time I was watching, even Vic and Bob, they were on fire then, weren't they? Oh my god! So Vic and Bob changed my life. Yeah, yeah. that was such a seeing Big Night Out on Channel Four. It's nineteen ninety one. It was it was the World Cup as well. It was I think it was around Italian ninety because I remember being at my dad's girlfriend's house and watching a trailer for Vic and Bob while we were watching the football. That was a real magic time. Yeah, so maybe seven or something. Red Dwarf is another thing. Blackadder, yeah. just everything. I just absorbed it all. I would just sit and tape everything and watch it and I thought oh like one day I'd really like to be not a stand-up because I'm I couldn't do that but writing or or performing stuff and uh you know I'm sort of closer to that now than ever which is great (laughs) absolutely absolutely tell me the first record do you remember buying Ruth so the, there was, um, let me just hold on a second. Just get to my notes. Oh yeah, the first record I ever bought. So we'd, I'd had records when we bought before that I'll talk about, but the first thing I ever bought with my own money was Common People by Pulp. And I was about 12, I think. I mean, what better start? <laughs> what better start? I mean, that's it's one of the greatest records ever made. Isn't it just? And Pulp are one of my favourite bands. I was a real massive Pulp fan. Full um, version. It's got to be the full version. Got to be the full version. That's the best bit. That's yeah. the best bit, isn't it? That yeah. bit with yeah. the you'll never understand how it feels to live your life in a minute. Oh, it's mate. Perfect, yeah. it, it makes me a little bit emotional, that bit. It oh, does that. me too, yeah. Love it. Yeah. <laughs> so when you play it, when you play it, you play the full version. At the club, yeah. Yeah. And like, but I sometimes play the live version. That they that was recorded when they stepped in for the roses and done Glastonbury, oh, and yeah. like and it builds and builds and builds and they they hold out that middle eight before they drop the you'll never understand how it feels to live your life and oh my god, just the <laughs> coolest fucking pop star. There's not been a better pop star since Jarvis Cocker. There, I've, I've said it. I was I was thinking that today when I was I was just reliving like seeing the the first time I ever saw it on top of the pop. So the reason mm. I bought the single, I'd I'd just been on holiday with my family to Mallorca and we came back and my brother had been in the house looking after the house and he said there's a song that's gone in at number two in the charts it's awful you're gonna hate it you're gonna absolutely hate it so I sat down to watch uh, Top of the Pops that week and I saw Jarvis and I was like well this is amazing it sounds like nothing I've ever heard before you're singing in a northern accent like you look you all look like nothing I've ever seen before and I thought I need to find out more about this band. So I went to um, the library. This was where I got most of my music from. Went to the Wensbury Library. And they all they'd got was his and hers. They hadn't got different class didn't come out until later yeah. that year. So I got his and hers. And actually his and hers is my favourite pulp album. Yeah, sorry. It's, it's got babies. Do you remember the first time? Lip, Lip Gloss is my favourite pulp song. Uh, is that has on intro? Say again? Is Razzmatazz on intro? Yeah. Uh, oh, no, I think... No, is it? I think, no, Razzmatazz is on the album before that, I think. Right. Oh, yeah, an intro, did you say? I think it is, yeah. Yeah, it is. Sorry, it's on intro. But, yeah, yeah. so... Oh, Razzmatazz is such a great song. Mm. And I'd got for, like, uh, one of my birthdays, like, a compilation of all the videos. Um, and, the, like, seeing the video for Razzmatazz, like, seeing the way that they pair it so well with the song, all of their videos, like was yeah you know just enhanced the experience yeah. of being a pulp fan for me um because then realizing again that they had a massive back catalogue they'd been going for years and years before they had any commercial success i don't even know how that happened how 
Comet People just came out of nowhere and got to number two. It was kept kept off the top by Robson and Jerome, it as was, I was yeah. remembering. So everyone at my school, I was probably just going into secondary school then. All the girls are into Robson and Jerome, soldier, soldier. <laughs> we know it well. Um, and I was just into Jarvis and Pulp and... Yeah, so I went to Asda, the Asda in um, Darleston, where they had a chart. And usually you can't, you couldn't get obscure things there, but because yeah. it was number two, I went and got the cassette. It was two ninety nine. But I really liked the B side more than Common People because I'd heard Common People so much. The B side was Underwear, which is mm. off different class, and I thought, yeah, this is a bit of me loving this. It's a bit dark. It's sounds good though you know and it's there's wit the, you know there's meaning to the lyrics or there's a double meaning or it's witty and um i spy off different classes a great yeah. track one of my favorites it must have been you know t t you said that you know you, you had a, a gritty upbringing you know yeah. in, uh, in in the midlands and then you know obsessed with you know sharp comedy as well i mean jarvis is the perfect hybrid of both of them things right it's mike lee to music right and that's the first time I've ever really thought about it like that, because I think yeah. at the time when I was so into pulp, I didn't even think about class or, you know, um, where I'd come from, because it's just my life. It was just the way I'd, I'd grown up. But yeah. then you said that, I think, oh, yeah, actually, it makes perfect sense, because yeah. now I can, at the time when he's talking about various things, like in Ice Boy, he says, take a year in Provence and shove it up your ass. Well, I mean, I was a 12 year old girl. So I'm like, well, I know it was on telly. And I think it was yeah. John Thor in it. That's all I could think. <laughs> but, but now I'm older and I go back, I'm like, I totally get all the things that you are talking yeah. about. It wasn't just, you know, um, just some, something I was, I was enjoying on some level. There's another yeah. level to it now where I can fully understand it. Oh, love it. Love it. Uh, we're I was going to say as well, that was a fantastic year for music, 1995. Oh, yeah. don't, don't get me started. Don't get me <laughs> yes, started. Yes, McCallum and Butler. Oh, <laughs> fucking hell. Ruth, I've got a level with you, right? When you sent these songs over, I thought to myself, right, don't talk too much. Let the guests talk, right? But you've chose so many fucking records that have been so important to me, right? Mm. I'd done a 90s night last Sunday at the Toothbrush, right? And my first track I played was Yes by McCormick and Butler because it's... The perfect fucking record. It's like it. David McCormick's voice breaks me in half. It just goes and goes and goes. It's got that song's got. I did not expect that from the geezer from Suede. I was like, whoa, yeah. as, as he just swallowed Phil Spector like this is just <laughs> huge. And it was, oh, it's perfect. That should have been a number one record. Oh, it's so good. And that was probably like the second single I bought. It was yeah. so, I saw that. And again, looking like no, nothing I'd ever seen before, yeah. like sounding amazing. It's like a sort of um, Dusty Springfield song. Yeah. So yeah. you know what? A little, little flute in the background. Yeah. yeah. What an amazing song. Like, yeah. Yeah, I can't. What, can, what more can I say that you've just yeah. Said? yeah. Oh, mate, it was, it was a, such an exciting year. And it was it's a really weird year because... To, to sort of put it in, in context for someone that was DJing then, you know, I I kind of started at my club in the beginning of the 90s when it was like kind of the, the Seattle stuff was happening and was getting the kind of like the, the, the carryover from the sort of tail end of Manchester. It was all very, there was lots of kind of Midlands bands. It was all the one stuff, Neds and, and stuff like that. It was all oh. huge, um, the T-shirt bands. And, um, and then it, all of the alternative clubs were still very alternative. But in 1995, I kind of guess in the wake of Oasis and Blur, and all of a sudden other people were going, oh, no, I quite like this music now. And like, and those people that kind of bought, definitely maybe I bought Park Life, before you know it, they're buying different class or they're buying Supergrass records and Blue Tones records. And then all of a sudden they're, they're going, oh, yeah, so what? I think that kind of year, there was that kind of weird sort of, you know, sort of lad stuff that really sort of kicked in, and uh, and it was it was a it felt it's really weird. I mean, I've I've read a quote from Noel Gallagher that he said he remember walking on at, at Nebworth, and as he walked out there, he said, "I think I've systematically killed the indie scene because he took it to the football terraces, he took it to everywhere, and all of a sudden, geezers were like into." You know, I was just like, they can't like Bell and Sebastian, they're mine. <laughs> well, it's, it's, you know, I was thinking, it's funny you mentioned that, because I was thinking about this as I was thinking about, like, 
that year for music and remembering that it was a whole so shortly after pulp came out with that it was the whole role with it and yeah. blur and oasis and thinking there were boys at my school who were into indie music but yeah. there was no sensitivity there it was all about aggression <laughs> there yeah. was, you know and i was thinking these guys and they were into the verve as well like so the verve oasis blur the smiths and stuff and it's like but it, they were horrible they were horrible you know laddie mm. lads and you're right, like it was just, um, it became sort of something different at that point. Yeah, absolutely. Um, although uh, A Girl Like You by Edwin Collins did come out and that's another great song. Oh, that's, that's on my list. <laughs> what a tune. Have you got any more you want to shout out from 95? Because I've got all day, mate. Like, Have if you really? 95, <laughs> get them out there, honestly. Just, just, well, I just made a note of a few, but um, I've got, it was uh, after... The next ch week's chart, Hold Me, Thrill Me, Kiss Me, Kill Me by You Two, which yep. is a great song. But um, have you got any you want to shout out? I've done all mine now. Oh, God, off the top of my head, no. But do you know what? It was like, it, it just, uh, to DJ then, it, at the time, it felt like the most exciting thing ever. It felt like, oh, hang on, everyone loves this music now. And, and unfortunately, it felt like it never kind of went back underground. It just kind of, I think, as you come out of that sort of mid-90s, the indie thing just kind of went a bit, a bit sort of acoustic. It all went to sort of Star Sailor Turing Breaks, Coldplay, and yeah. and it just got a little flat. And uh, and I, I like some of them bands, but um, it didn't feel like it had the excitement of what was going on a few years earlier. And uh, do you know what I mean? Yeah, it was really, and it was really quite. When I was looking at the charts earlier, it was really like a diverse chart. I mean, in the same chart, you've got M People search for the hero in that in that month, and then um, you know uh, that song is Saturday uh, again, Nightcrawlers. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, like it's Friday. Then <laughs> that was in there, and then you've got that side by side with more sort of obscure indie stuff. Yeah. But yeah, a great time. Uh, and that was around the time as well. They did, oh yeah, they did a thing called Brit Pop Now. Did you ever watch that on BBC Two? Echo Belly, Sleep That's Mark. it. Jean, Mary. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh, like, like, I'm going to tell you my Jean story, right? Please do. Do you know he follows me on Twitter, Martin oh, um, Rossiter? Rossiter. Yeah. Right. So uh, <laughs> when I set this podcast up, right? I, I had two guests that I wanted to get, right? And it, I, I set out that they were my dream guest was going to be Johnny Marr and Maxine Peake. Right? I've been really lucky that I got to talk to Maxine Peake. I've not had Johnny on yet. But then the other person that I thought, well, he's just gone to grand. No one's ever heard of him was Martin Russett from Jean, because I love Jean. I went to this podcast show thing in London and uh, to do this little live thing with one of my, my other pods. And I was, and this one of the people that come to watch it was chatting to her afterwards and, she was like, who would you like to have on off the beaten track? I said, do you know what, Martin Rossiter. I said, I can't find him anywhere. I'd love to speak to Martin Rossiter. And I went, right, I've got to go anyway. And as I walked out the door, I physically bumped into Martin Rossiter. No way. And so that kind of face you just pulled there, that kind of wide-eyed no way, was exactly what I'd done in Martin Rossiter's face. <laughs> Like he also was in on it. I was like, fucking hell, Martin Rossiter. And he just looked terrified. <laughs> and I was like, mate, this is meant to be. And he was just like, mate, what, are you all right? And I was like, yes, I've just been telling someone I really wanted to meet you and talk to you. And he was like, okay. And then I calmed down and explained it. And then, yeah, went down to Brighton and and, uh, and interviewed him. And he was lovely. But oh, uh, it was a very, very surreal moment, probably more so for him. But uh, oh, that Britpop Now show, though, was fucking amazing yeah i taped it off the telly again when i heard it was going to be on because i knew pulp were going to be on but again that introduced me to other bands i didn't know like pj harvey was on there i hadn't heard yeah. anything by her well, menswear on there menswear were on there i was a menswear fan yeah they're they're, they're um they used to come to me club they're they're all essex boys uh, oh are they yeah yeah <laughs> Yeah, like, and the, the show ended, like, so Blur was on there, obviously, and the show ended with um, Common People. Yeah. Which like, show, you know, yeah. something on a great performance. But, yeah, it was that sort of, it just it just felt really exciting. Yeah. I mean, more probably exciting for you because you were living it. I was, you know, I wasn't in Camden going down the good mixer. Oh. I was in Darleston, <laughs> little, like, girl just thinking, oh, yeah, this is great. Yeah. One day, maybe I'll move to London and here we, we are. We would actually do that. I'd never move to London, but we did once a week. We'd drive up to Camden 
with just our little demo tapes of our band and we'd just be walking around a good mix of trying to find Andy Ross from Food Records, seeing who was there. And you'd always see someone from an indie band just sort of like, just kind of probably wanting to be seen actually. And like, and we'd be like, oh, look, can you give that to your record company? And they'd be like, yeah, 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 no worries. But it, it did feel very exciting being a, I suppose I would have been about 18, 19, just going up there and, and it was all happening in that little sort of, circle of, of of London it was it was very exciting it's like the ideal age isn't it yeah but oh, I, I went to the mix there for like the first time only about six months ago because um I was going somewhere with some friends and we needed to go for a drink somewhere and I thought oh this is it I thought it would be I remember sending fan mail to menswear at the good mixer you had to send it to the good mixer <laughs> so sending oh, I love you I love I love daydreamer I think it's great <laughs> anyway <laughs> Fantastic. Do you know what though? Like, I went in there about a year ago, and it's exactly the same. It, that's exactly how it was in oh, the really? 90s. Yeah, just a pool table and a great jukebox, and that's it. Yeah, I mean, fair enough. Right, let's go clubbing. Tell me the song that soundtracked your years clubbing, please. Well, I'm going to go into like a preamble. Before. Okay. Do you want me to just tell you the song first? It's up to you. <laughs> um. So I'm in two minds about what song I'm going to settle on. I sent you a few choices, but I think I'm going to settle on either. <laughs> uh, There's close sort of similar MGMT, Electric Feel, or Haste of Jealous Lovers by The Rapture, maybe the latter. Um, but it's not necessarily like cut and dry because I had a few like genres of clubbing. So in the early 2000s, uh, I used to go to a night in Wolverhampton at the Civic Hall called Corrosion, and that was metal, new metal, because metal and new metal, because all my friends, I hanged around, I was in a band with like some guys, and they were just all into that. So I was like, okay, I'm going to try and be into this as much as I can. So I was really into Nirvana, but it's not the same as, you know, um, new metal or metal. They yeah. were into things like Metallica, Korn, um, Slipknot, stuff that I don't. I just could never get on board with. So but it was like, huge then, that music, wasn't it? It was, yeah. it was the biggest thing out there. It was, it was. So it's like, okay, if I can't, I was like, if I can't find something that's like a group that totally fits that, then the next best thing is metal, like for mm. me to, and you know, I like the Deftones, but it was all a bit po-faced for me. I like a bit of, you know, a, a bit of wittiness to the lyrics. I mean, you can, I, I like the Blood Ain Gang because they were quite funny, but and yeah. I love Tenacious D. I'm a big Tenacious D fan. Mm. But, um, but yeah, so I'd go to that. But then, um, then sort of after I left, started working in Birmingham, then emo was the thing a few years later. And I used to go to a club called The Planet again in Wolverhampton with a few friends I'd made who were into emo. And let me tell you, I absolutely hated every second of it. I found the music boring. Uh, the thing that <clears throat> the track that's saying sorry I'm just gonna have a drink the <clears throat> the track that's saying tracks I'm gonna have to cough sorry <laughs> <coughs> sorry the track that's saying tracks that me not enjoying any of that is Panic at the Disco I wrote mm. since Not Tragedy I just find it very obnoxious and then after that, I got into, met more people who were into sort of indie music. Again, not exactly the sort of thing I was into, but it would be snobs in Birmingham, the club I would go to, which yeah. is famous Birmingham Indie Club, The Killers, Oasis, Arctic Monkeys, The Strokes, which was kind of, you know, good enough for me. Um, and it was around that time that they would play stuff like MGMT, Electric Feel, or The Rapture. They're the, they're the sort of stand out tracks. Yeah. But I'm not look again, not really looking at, back at that time in a, in a positive way I'm kind of like okay if I had to pick the best of probably yeah. the best night I ever had is when I went out to a pub in Birmingham and they played Jumping the Lion by Ari Belafonte and that was amazing yeah. like that was really exciting but it, I wouldn't say it's same track those days because it wasn't played but I also I learned to DJ as well and I did a few DJ nights um I was in this feminist DJ group in Birmingham this girl put an advert on Facebook saying, hey, women, do you want to learn to DJ? And I was like, yes, please. So they taught me. But then I was like, I wasn't really accepted by that group either <laughs> because you were only supposed to play female artists, which I'd done, but none of us really discussed what we were going to play for some reason. Like I'd only met the girls once. And then the girl who was running the thing put me on at 7 p.m., 
And I had all bangers ready to go. So I was playing like Fuck the Pain Away by Peaches at 7.25 p.m. Too early. <laughs> no one, no one, but like no one discussed it with me. I didn't know. Um, and then I played Milkshake by Calice. And then after the night had finished, the girl who ran the group sent in a, like a passive aggressive Facebook message saying, if I ever hear that song, I have to leave the room. It's disgusting. Because I guess the premise of the song is... I'm trying to attract men and I'm, yeah. you know, more attracted to me. But I hadn't even, I just thought, where's the banger though? Yeah. So when I realised that that, like, it wasn't fun, I thought DJing would be fun. It, mm. it wasn't fun for me. It was actually very stressful. I kind of stopped, I kind of stopped doing it after that. But what I enjoyed about it was being able to play whatever I wanted. Whereas when I would go to an indie club, it's like, oh, it's Mr. Brightside again. It's, oh, it's, you know. Yeah, cool. Last night on the strokes again. I'm sure your DJ sets aren't like that, Stu. No, I just play them two records pretty much. <laughs> well, they're crowd pleasers. So. <laughs> it, it, is, it is a tough one because you do, as a DJ, you, it, I think it's just because for, for every record I play that isn't Mr. Brightside, I will get asked by the next generation of young kids coming through the club for Mr. Bright. You think, my God, like, he's not sick of this record yet. But, but yeah, I think as a DJ, as long as you kind of just give them a few that they want to hear, you can kind of then sort of play your own stuff and, and just kind of not give too much away, retain a bit of integrity in that and just kind of get the balance right. It's, it's not easy. And, I mean, starting off in a feminist DJ collective, like, I mean, I fucking love La Tigra, but there's only got so many records you can play, aren't there? <laughs> right? Echo Beach, we've heard it. We've heard Echo Beach. We've heard Chicks on Speed. We know. I mean, yeah. I love, yeah, La, T- La Tigra, exactly. Mm. Uh, Slater Kinney, okay, fine. You know, you've got to go somewhere. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I found it a bit um, restrictive. Yeah. Uh, and I just... I didn't expect it to be so policed in the way yeah. it was. I think the girl who ran it absolutely detested me. So I just left. I said, do you know what? I've realised this isn't really for me. Yeah. So I did a couple of things on my own. Like um, my mate Ray used to book me to do pub gigs and stuff. And I did someone's wedding. Um, but I was a bit haphazard. I used to stop the track like while it was playing. I just forget what I was doing. I played Beck at the wrong speed. And someone was like, why is this song? Just things like that. Um well, you know, the people enjoyed it. So if John Peel would have played it at the wrong speed, everyone would have just gone, This is what a fucking maverick move. Like, yeah. Oh my god, that's so true. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, anyway. So yeah, I'm gonna go with Electric Feel. Electric Feel is and, and House of Jealous Lovers, they're two songs I do really like. Um, but they just remind me of of just thinking, Oh, I wish I was at home. <laughs> they're the best ones. They're the best ones. <laughs> What a night! Uh, oh, I know. I I know. Well, I don't. I don't do it anymore. The best thing for me is if you go to a pub and then there's a DJ on, and you go to the pub maybe after work, and then it ends up being a sort of you know a late one where they're playing tunes and everyone gets up and dances, and it's there's not that sort of we're going to a night yeah. thing. Yeah. But the best that. nights are always like that, right? The ones oh, that yeah. just kind of happen rather than planned. Hundred percent. Yeah. I'm going to take you home, and uh, <laughs> for track six. Favourite song from an artist from your home county, please. So I was going to go with, I know I changed my mind. I flip-flopped on this. I said it was going to be Terry All Chasing a Rainbow. But right. I think I'm going to stick with my original choice, which was Goodbye to Jane by Slade. Mm. Oh, fantastic. So just because I love Terry All, we've touched on him earlier. I think he's amazing. Had all of his stuff. And Chasing a Rainbow, I saw on the chart show, taped it off the telly. It's the first thing I'd ever seen by him. Went to Sunday Records in Warsaw to buy the CD because they didn't have it in Asda, obviously, because I don't think it charted. Maybe it's number 40, something like that. And uh, just became obsessed with him after that. But he's from Coventry, and I know he's mm. from my county, and I want to represent the black country yeah. where Slade are from. So Noddy Holder was born just up the road from me in a place called Karma in, near Warsaw, near Darleston, where I was born. My mum was asked out by Dave Hill when she was younger. So it's like... What? Yeah, so <laughs> asked her out. <laughs> so it's like a big thing, and I don't think... The black country always gets sort of lumped in with Birmingham, which is just so wrong because we are very culturally different. Like we don't in the black country where I'm from, you'll still see a horse like tied up outside a pub. 
you will there's no takeaway coffees no one got a costa it's like takeaway coffees are regarded with suspicion one word witchcraft that's the way that's the way they see it so i need to i need to represent Slade and I didn't know that much about them until I watched Reeves and Mortimer and saw him do Slade in residence and that was just amazing to hear them talking mm. like me and people that you know and that I really enjoyed that it was really funny and again a sense of fun with Slade like you know a sense of humour don't take themselves too seriously but they got some absolutely cracking tunes huge tunes huge. and like let, let's talk about Noddy's voice yeah amazing <laughs> Noel Gallagher's quote I've, got, I've quoted Noel Gallagher twice already. I'm not even a particular Oasis fan, <laughs> but he does say good quotes. Uh, when does. asked him, uh, and when he was asked about Slade, he went, "They write fucking great songs and look like fucking Diddy men." And I just thought, "Mate, that's Slade. <laughs> they look like fucking Diddy men that write bangers." <laughs> <laughs> so true oh my god yeah just just love them and I always uh, said more recently that if I was a uh, you know a darts darts player I'd want goodbye to Jane to be my walkout music because it's got to be a goer yeah it's a shame it's not goodbye to Ruth because that would make it perfect you know (laughs) it's like just really really goes and then I said that or either anything by the nightingales um Mm. they're a black well I know that Rob Lloyd is um from Cannock I don't know if the rest of them are from the black country, but they're a fairly recent addition to uh, the kind of the, the bands that I like because I only heard of them. It was just before actually Stuart Lee did King Rocker, if you've yeah. seen it. So it just, I actually heard about them before then. And then I watched that and I was like, okay, well, they're amazing. Yeah. I actually went to see them live at the Lexington last year. Stuart Lee was stood right in front of me, but I was too scared to speak to him because I love him so much. But it was an amazing gig. Like drums were really loud. Like, yeah. Uh, just really, you know, urgency in the songs and like that feeling of uh, just kind of just sort of doing their own thing, like the fall, you know, yeah. and just someone just saying words. They had Ted Ted Chippington, yep. them, and that was really great as well. So yeah, and any and I'm proud to say that they're from the Black Country and yeah. Slade as well. So you know, it's not all skips on fire. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> Fantastic choice. Last track. Ruth, I'm going to ask you to tell me a song that you think many people may not know that you would like them to hear. Well, I really wanted to pick something that no one had heard. And I think I've probably done this. I've picked mm. Play That Funky Horn by Roy Chubby Brown, the comedian. Okay. I mean, have you just chosen it because no one's heard it? Or have you cho- is there a reason to this? <laughs> I've chosen it because... Um, I stumbled across it and I d- th- this is not to say I think it's good. I just think everyone should hear it. I yeah. just think everyone should hear it because if you thought that Roy Chubby Brown's music career ended when he did Smokey, uh, Who the Fuck is Alice in 1995. There's a tune from 1995 I forgot to mention. You think that was the start and end of his musical career. You're wrong because mm. I was looking for something on Spotify for like a joke with um, a speaker, like a wireless speaker. I wanted to play some stand-up Roger Brown through it. And I ended up finding out that he's done three albums called Friends, Friends 1, Friends 2, Friends 3. And they're serious songs. And you wouldn't believe it, Stu. I looked him up again today. He's done a fourth one. He's just put a fourth one out. It's just so many one. friends. Uh... <laughs> Who knew? Who knew? Uh, so play that funky horn. Is I picked I just listened to some of the songs on Friends 3 and I picked that one because it just sounds like, I don't want to say shit, but because he's doing his thing, but it's just mad that it's Roy Chubby Brown. Like, it's that's just, you just do not associate him with with doing serious music. If someone played me that, I could have 500,000 guesses and I would never say Roy Chubby Brown. Exactly. It's it's all right. It's like it, it just sounds like a kind of kind of a little bit of a sort of disco sort of funk track, really. Yeah. Um it's it sort of holds its own, which is surreal. We're talking about Roy Chubby Brown. It's very, very odd. And yeah, I mean there's some other questionable stuff on his Spotify, but but that track, do you know what? Go go check it out. 
and uh, and yeah, let us uh, let us know what you think because uh, it's all right. I would encourage any of uh, your listeners to just go and have a look, and you'll be amazed because I play it to people, and they're like, "What the hell?" Like they can't believe what they're hearing. Yeah. I feel like I've stumbled upon something like that no one else has, and I yeah. feel like. You know, a song that you think few people have heard that they need to hear. I thought, what else can I say? There's loads of songs that your listenership's probably already heard. They won't have heard anything quite like this, though. 100%. Did you play that the night that you got thrown out of the feminist DJ collective? I wish I bloody had, eh? I wish I'd played from where we stand up show and what it's really like to be offended, yeah? Hey, if you're offended by Milkshake, by Khalees... You, better, you, don't, you don't want to hear about his wife's fanny, do you? That's the last thing you know, yeah. Honest to God, seriously. I'm still really angry about that. Anyway, yeah. Um, oh, wonderful. Rev, we put together a Spotify playlist so people can go and listen to... Uh, I can't believe really I'm saying this. We put together a Spotify playlist so people can go and listen to Roy Chubby Brown amongst uh, some absolutely... If you stumble across this playlist by accident, it's fucking surreal because there's so many great records and then, yeah, you've got Roy Chubby Brown uh, just closing proceedings. Um, but I've got to be honest, as I said to you earlier, you've chose so many fucking great records today that uh, got me super, super hyped because... Yeah, so many of them mean quite a lot to me as well. So, yeah, it's been an absolute uh, delight talking records with you, mate. Yeah. Um, what's happening? And if people want to keep up to speed with what's happening, where do they go? So, what's happening? Uh, well, I've just done my first like bit of writing for Joe Lysett's show, which has been amazing. I've really enjoyed doing that. So, like, I'm happy to do writing for anyone who wants to employ me to work on their show. You can find me at on Twitter at dank underscore Aykroyd. My name is Ruth Husko, though. So, uh, you can find me there. Uh, um, the other thing I'm doing is I'm, I don't know if it's a secret. Oh, it's probably not a secret. I'm just working uh, to do a pitch for something for BBC Sounds um but that's just still in the the works at the minute so yeah I'm tweeting and I'm writing and uh working on stuff yeah just keep up with me on Twitter um I'm on Instagram as well Ruth underscore Husko um and yeah just uh find me on Twitter and enjoy my tweets I had to set up a new account but uh yeah you can find me there (laughs) Wonderful. Well, if it's cool with you, when this comes out, we'll um, we'll tag you in it so people can come and find you if they haven't done already. Yeah, great. Ruth, thanks so much, mate. I'm going to press stop. Don't go anywhere. Okay.